welcome everyone to the December 2020 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm Jeremy Veldman. Hope everybody's staying healthy and safe and happen, having a happy holiday season. Want to take a moment to welcome everyone. Great meeting for you tonight. We're going to talk about telescopes. This is kind of our buying your first telescope for Christmas, either for yourself or as a gift to give to someone else seminar. So we're going to go over some basic concepts regarding telescopes to give you some ideas. Um, tonight's meeting is somewhat subjective. Everybody's philosophy and criteria for selecting a telescope is different. So yeah, it's, it's by no means um, hard and fast, but hopefully you'll get some good information out of this. And also we want to make this meeting, since we're doing a Zoom call tonight and it's live, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So don't be, don't be afraid to chime in, those of you who are on live. Of course, we got the, the chat as well, so feel free to enter your comments and questions in there. You know, we're gonna have two, two or three primary presenters tonight getting through the material, but again, we wanna make this more a discussion rather than just a, a hard presentation. So feel free to chime in anytime. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and kind of kick off the preliminaries. So we are the Memphis Astronomical Society. Again, we're a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education and astronomy and related sciences. You can find us online, we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on Twitter. And again, take a minute to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. I wanna say a special thanks to the now 1200 plus subscribers on our channel. Hope you're getting some great value out of our meetings and content. And our website is memphisastro.org. And if you're, if you're not on our email list already and you'd like to join our email list, go to the website joinmas.com and enter your name and your email address. And we will add you to our list. We send out updates about once a week regarding upcoming meetings, events, you know, observing sessions, anything related to our society. So you're not on our email list already, go to joinmas.com and enter your details. Our website, of course, is memphisastro.org. Got some great information for you. There's links on the left side of our website, um, really regarding the material that we're going to cover tonight on how to buy a telescope and also getting help setting up your first telescope if you bought a telescope. So there's some good write-ups there. There's also a calendar of events on the left side of our website. And of course, not much new. We've basically been shut down. Now I will say, in addition to COVID, the weather has been not very favorable the last several months. I mean, I, I can't remember. Well, I think I would go back to August, the last time we had favorable skies for observing. So, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, we have not had good weather for observing but we're, we're officially still shut down as we ride this out. However, um, first of all, tomorrow night does look clear. If you're on our email list, stay, you know, keep an eye out for notices. I think we will open things back up tomorrow night. That's the fifth to have a, uh, you know, again, a socially distance style observing session. So bring your own equipment, stay away, and uh, just basically take advantage of our dark sky site. Now, in addition to that, we've been doing what are called virtual star parties every month. And this is not an MAS sponsored um, event, but we are a participant. So we've done this for the last several months. We've got another one coming up next month or ne next week, I'm sorry, that'll be December the 12th. And the long range forecast doesn't look favorable here. So but this is a Tennessee statewide event. It's hosted by the Dyer Observatory at Vanderbilt University. So, hey, you know, next Saturday, seven o'clock central, if you're interested in tuning in, we'll send out a link to this event also. And uh, we basically got astronomers from around the state either showing live feeds of objects or just sharing concepts related to astronomy. So it's just another outlet to get your astronomy fix. I believe we'll be covering the conjunction if it's clear whoever whoever's going to be out that night. Of course, we've got Jupiter and Saturn. There's going to be a conjunction on the 21st of December, basically the closest that they've been in, in uh, something like 400 years. I can't think of the exact year, but um, somewhere in the, in, the, uh, in the 1600s was the last time Jupiter and Saturn were this close. 
and they'll be close again on the 21st of December. So hopefully we'll be covering that at this event. But anyway, long story short, next Saturday, December the 12th, we will be doing another Tennessee statewide virtual star party. So keep an eye out for that. Now, if you're a paying member, you get access to the media right. And of course, that's our monthly newsletter. Got some great content in there, such as uh, astrophotography gallery, sky charts for the, the particular month, as well as minutes from past board meetings. Not going to read the minutes tonight, but if you're a paying member, the minutes are actually published in each edition of the media right. So you can kind of keep up with our organization. So this is just one of the benefits uh, being a member, you get access to our, our monthly newsletter. And now for everyone tonight, I'll have links to these two documents in the description below the, 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 below the video. So when we publish this on YouTube, you'll have access to these two documents. That of course is the December sky chart and then also a membership application. So if you're interested in becoming a member of our organization, just click on the link to the membership application, download it, fill it out. It's in PDF. There's fields already filled out. So you don't have to print it out and fill it out by hand and then scan it and send it back to us. Just fill it out in the, in the document and then email it to us at memphisastronomicalsociety.com. And of course you can send us any, any email, you know, correspondence, whether it's questions, comments, anything um, to that email address also. So that pretty much covers the preliminaries. Again, tonight's topic is going to be on telescopes. And at this point in time, I'm actually going to turn the meeting over to Rick Honey, who is going to talk about officers and elections for the 2021 MAS board. And then he's going to kick off our discussion tonight on telescopes. So Rick, turn it over to you at this point. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Let me share my screen. Okay, I'm sharing the right thing. All right, what I, um, so we um, struggled a little bit this year, although serendipity works out because um, as the nominating committee tried to find, uh, willing uh, suckers, I mean, volunteers to um, uh, participate in the uh, board of directors and uh, officer positions. We, uh, uh, we also struggled with how are we going to conduct an election on a Zoom meeting. The bad news is we didn't figure out how to do that. The good news is we don't have any one volunteering for a position that is being opposed by anyone else. So basically we have some people that were uh, stepping down from uh, their positions. Uh, Richard Townley, who's been our secretary for the last few years is not gonna be able to continue. So uh, Sarita Joshi has uh, volunteered to take that position of secretary. I'll start that uh, Jeremy will continue as president. Mark Matthews uh, will continue as VP of observing. I will continue as treasurer. Freddie has uh, volunteered to hold the position of VP of programs as long as the rest of us volunteer to help him uh, make sure we have programs lined up. So uh, Freddie will become that new position. Uh, although at the time we closed nominations at the last meeting, uh, that position was unfilled. <clears throat> uh, we also have Steve Armert, who is, will continue on the board, and he is our director of membership. Uh, Brian Hill will continue, and we'd like to welcome Ann Viano, who I believe is on tonight. I thought I saw her. Steve Wright, a new member, and Steve is on tonight, and um, he's going to uh, be able to bring some uh, uh, good things to the MAS in the form of a uh, uh, 
I, he works in the advertising business, so he's got ideas about how to help us uh, spruce up our logos and and newsletters and stuff we do. I think we're going to have some pretty uh, neat things come out of that. And Eileen Rudstrom, a, uh, a member who has been quite enthusiastic. I love her enthusiasm whenever I run into her at the meetings. So I'm looking forward to working with all of them. Brian Hancock is stepping down. Keith Latiolet, our former vice president of programs, uh, who did a wonderful job, is starting to travel more. So he's not going to be able to do that. And then Ron Peck uh, is stepping down from the board. So many thanks to the um, outgoing members. At this time, uh, if a member, the board uh, would entertain a motion to instate the new roster by acclamation if a member would so move. So moved. So Bill has moved and we need a second. I second. All right, so Freddie seconds. And so um, all those in favor of uh, accepting this roster by acclamation. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Any opposed? That's really all we want to hear from. And um, thank you all very much. This is your officers and directors for next year. And uh, we love, I'll speak for myself and I believe everybody else that's been on, that's on the board or has been on the board. We love doing it, but it is work and we hope you appreciate it. So that's that we are now official for 2021 so now we're going to get started with the uh, program uh, also by the way while i'm thinking about it i have six extra large mas sweatshirts this is the sweatshirt <laughs> this is not extra large this is 3x sorry I have six extra larges, uh, three in white with a, a dark blue logo and three just like this one. I will, uh, any donation to the MAS will get you one of those sweatshirts. Um, you can actually go on our website. There's a link there to do so. Um, send me an email. Tell me. Uh, extra large is the only size we've got and only have three of each. That's it. You want one, uh, make a donation to the MAS. Let me know about it. And it's yours. I'd love to get, I'd love to see us get 15 bucks a piece for them. But at this point, I will take anything. Uh, all right. So tonight, uh, New telescope seminar. We've done this before. We do it essentially every year. We're going to try to shake it up a little bit this year and tell you things you might want to consider when buying a telescope, some ideas for beginner telescopes. A uh, quick review of basic telescope types, basic mount types, and then I will go into some more details about reflector telescopes. Keith Latiole, um, who I'm, I'm not sure whether he's on tonight or not, but he did a video of his presentation because I didn't think he was going to be able to be here. And then Jeremy will pick up the catadoptics toward the end. Then we'll talk a little bit more about accessories and some other stuff and questions and answers. And feel free, um, you know, if during the course of things, if you want to ask a question, unmute and ask, or uh, I'm afraid if you just did the raise your hand thing, uh, I'm the administrator of the meeting. I might not see it, but uh, you can give it a try. So, um, so this is, this is, this first slide is indicative of do what I say, not what I did. <laughs> this is my very first telescope. Um, so I dove into this thing head first. There was a comet that was going to crash into Jupiter. 
And I thought I wanted a front row seat to that. And, uh, uh, and, and as hard as this is going to be to believe, I found that in a pawn shop. And uh, there's a long story behind that. But uh, after having done so, I figured that was God's message to me to dive headfirst into astronomy because, uh, and boy, it's been fun. So it's 30 years ago, just about. This was actually my second telescope and probably my favorite to this day. And this is one of the reasons that I talk about reflectors and more importantly, Dobsonians. So how to choose a telescope? Well, the things to consider, especially for visual use is aperture. And by aperture, what we mean is the overall diameter of the primary element the either the, that big lens at the front of a refractor or the big mirror at the back of a reflector. That first, uh, the diameter of that first element is essentially what's gonna gather the light. And the more light you gather, the more you can do with it, including magnify it. But magnification isn't everything. Uh, unfortunately, especially in the lower end, you know, the, the box stores and the uh, department store stuff tend to want to sell magnification like stereo people want to sell watts. You know, that's not, that's, that's a minor uh, consideration of how good a stereo sounds and how, uh, how good a telescope is to look through. Uh, many of them advertise well over what's the usable limit in a telescope. Uh, anybody that's advertising something that where you can 900 power, you know, that's just ridiculous. Uh, in a four inch diameter telescope, you're good to 200 power maximum. And that's on a good night. And we don't have that many good nights around here. So, uh, don't get hooked into that game, then is bigger always better? And essentially the answer is yes, but I will tell you that once you start getting over about 10 or 12 inches, you start, you'll, you'll find nights where you'll set up a nice big telescope and you'll look through it and go, why did I pay this much money for this? Because this is terrible. And what you'll find out is that the atmospheric conditions will play a much bigger part in how well you can see the bigger the telescope gets. So back in 2010, you know, I used to tell people to try to buy binoculars and I still do, you know, if you're gonna start in this thing, get a good pair of binoculars and, and you'll be amazed what you can see with that. <laughs> there you go, Steve. <laughs> and so if, uh, uh, you know, and at the end of the day, if you find out astronomy is not for you, you've got a nice pair of binoculars, take to the football game or whatever, bird watching. But the, uh, a lot of people try to buy telescopes for their children. And uh, this is where we see a lot of really flimsy, inexpensive, hard to use, uh, refractors and, and other telescopes because people don't look at things like we see here in this picture and think of them as telescopes. They look, they're thinking of a refractor or something. And uh, these Dobsonian four and a half to six inch Dobbs, uh, either in a tabletop version or floor standing, you can get for, you know, two to three hundred dollars, two to two and a half. And they're excellent uh, places to start excellent optics. Uh, they typically come with, with at least one decent eyepiece. Uh, this little cute ball thing here is not available anymore. It was replaced by this in recent years, about the same price. Uh, and, uh, if you, and this is going to be, you know, essentially for young people, if you were buying for a teenager, say high school, junior high, or even yourself, um, whoops, um, 
you can look at the same kind of thing in a in an eight inch or I wouldn't even I probably wouldn't stop at a six. I'd go ahead and get an eight. And you're looking at uh three or four hundred dollars and and uh you've got a telescope that it will likely stay with you the rest of your life is you can carry it outside set it down and use it quickly you don't have to polar align it you don't have to do a lot of the stuff you have to do with a, an equatorial mount you just you want to go out and look at something a comet hey jupiter's up you want to show it to somebody set it down it's kind of like a point and shoot camera just get it set down point it at what you want to look at and and go and then you can share the joy of this uh, hobby with other people quickly. So there are basically three types of telescopes. Now there are variations on every one of these themes and, and there are some in-between stuff, but uh, they fundamentally fall into three categories, either a reflector telescope, telescopes that use mirrors, refractor telescopes, telescopes that use lenses, or catadioptric telescopes, a telescope that uses both. Uh, so we'll go into those uh, next. So reflector telescopes, essentially the, the primary pro of, tele, of ref reflectors is you get the most aperture per dollar. And that is the biggest amount of light collecting capability. You can start with big. This is an eight inch uh, daub, uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, and I'm gonna focus on daubs. You can buy these on equatorial mounts. That's fine too. I'll go into that in a few minutes, but uh, uh, Again, I'm a big proponent of having a handy to use daub, no matter what else you've got. And, uh, or you can up, you up that size a bit. This is, a, I think a 24. And uh, you can go ahead and get real big. In fact, for this very same reason that this is the most aperture you can get for the money that the, all the world's land-based observatories use reflector telescopes, one design or another. This is, most of them are typically uh, cask grain designs. And then of course, there's the best reflector telescope that we've ever been privileged to get pictures from, and that's the Hubble. And this too is a cask grain design Hubble uh, reflector telescope. So what are the two differences in a form of a diagram? A Newtonian reflector basically has a uh, uh, concave mirror in the back with a diagonal mirror uh, back up at the front uh, support system to hold the mirror in place. And that reflects that cone of light out to a focuser with an eyepiece in it. The cast grain design of a telescope is essentially the same thing, another concave primary mirror, but the secondary mirror is hyperbolic and not flat. And the neat thing about that is, is that it essentially adds focal length to the telescope. You, are, uh, you can get incredibly long focal lengths with a short optical tube. And then it run, focus, runs the, uh, the light cone out back out the back of the telescope uh, through a hole in the mirror, in the middle of the mirror, which is would be in the shadow of the uh, secondary mirror anyway. So uh, this is a, a not as popular, but very good. Almost all of your professional observatories use Cassegrain telescope designs of one form or another. So the bad things of a reflector telescope are pretty simple. Um, you've got some loss of resolution and brightness due to the central obstruction, that mirror. The mirror. And then uh, 
you can't, you, it's hard to see here, but the image on the right is just a little bit fuzzier than the one on the left. And this is, this represents the secondary mirror. And this shows you what it does to the diffraction uh, rings of a point source image. And it, it is there, it is noticeable. And a Newtonian, this is not too bad. And something, or a Cassegrain, and something like a rich accretion, if you ever get into, into this that deep, the secondary mirrors and the rich accretion are such a large percent of the primary size that it makes them effectively not very good for visual work. Stunning for astrophotography, but not good to look through. Coma is the other uh, thing that occurs in uh, a Newtonian. Uh, the uh, secondary, the primary mirror is typically uh, uh, parabolic. Some are spherical, and they, when they are that, then coma gets real bad. But if it's got a parabolic primary out toward the edge of the of the field of view, stars will start to take on this little uh, uh, fuzzy uh, edge, kind of looks a little bit like a comet. And that'll occur all around the outside edges of the field of view. And then the next uh, thing that occurs in a reflector is what's called diffraction spikes. That's these little spikes that come around the bright, uh, brightest objects in the field, mostly stars, will have these uh, spikes. And that comes from the holder for the secondary mirror. But the hassle of a Newtonian telescope is collimation. And it's, it's not bad. Once you get it, it's kind of easy to keep up with and easy to do. But it takes a few minutes to figure out what it is you're looking at, how to collimate a telescope, the principles behind it. Essentially, what you're doing is making sure that all of the optics, the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, are all in the same plane, on the same axis, and, and working together to move the images back and forth. It can get rather complex. But Again, they're easily adjustable. If you've ever had a Newtonian or seen one, they typically have three screws on the back of them for adjusting the primary. So they're stuck out there where you can get to them. Uh, let's see. So I want to talk about mounts for just a minute. Fundamentally, just like there are fundamentally three different kinds of telescopes, there's fundamentally two different kinds of mounts. There are tremendous variations on all of this, but you have altitude azimuth mount, something typical that you'd have on a camera tripod or a video camera head, which is what this is. Basically, it allows the telescope to tilt up and down and swivel around uh, side to side. An equatorial mount is designed to move in one, at least in one direction in sync with the rotation of the earth. So that you track uh, the objects in the sky as the earth rotates. And what you'll typically do is line up this axis parallel to the axis of rotation of the earth. And that is basically by pointing it at the North star. So here's a couple of uh, diagrams about an altitude azimuth mount and the kind of uh, variations it can come in besides something like this uh, uh, camera head here, uh, fork mounted telescopes that are just mounted straight up and down on their tripod are uh, basically working in an alt azimuth mode. Also, Dobsonians uh, sit in what's called a rocker box. This box will pivot on its base plate, and then the tube will pivot in this rocker arm, allowing to the altitude to be adjusted. And an equatorial mount, again, the primary idea here is to align that axis of the telescope's mount with the axis of rotation of the Earth. And the simplest way to do that is to point it at the north, get this axis lined up with the north star. 
And then as the telescope rotates, it'll keep up with what's going on in the sky. If you've got a clock drive for it, then it tracks automatically. This is a uh, diagram of how many of these fork mount telescopes that while it works in alt azimuth mode can also work as a equatorial mount with what's called an equatorial wedge. So basically you take the same telescope and use this wedge mount to align this fork with the North Pole. And then as this telescope rotates on that mount, it'll track what's in the sky. Fundamentally, there's no difference. And as you have, if you have a telescope that tracks some of these more modern electronic go-to track uh, telescopes, even in the altitude azimuth mode, will track whatever they're looking at. And they're adjusting the rotation of the base and the altitude of the telescope itself as it looks uh, at what you're tracking, just like an equatorial mount telescope will do. The fundamental difference is that the object that you're looking at will rotate in the eyepiece as it goes across the sky. For visual use, that's no problem, but if you're going to try to take a long exposure picture, that's where it becomes an issue. Uh, that's why anybody that's doing astrophotography typically has an equatorial mount so that uh, not only are they tracking it across the sky, but the orientation of that object in the eyepiece remains the same as it tracks across the sky. So next up is a description of reflector telescopes by our own Keith Latiolet. And this is a picture of his very fine uh, reflector telescope, refractor telescope and its mount, a very nice uh, uh, equatorial mount. And uh, he does a lot of astrophotography. So this is a setup for that. And he uh, did us a video that we get to watch for that. Okay, let's talk about refractors. So I'm biased. I like them. I like them a lot. Now, that's probably why I'm doing this part of the presentation. I do own a number of different telescopes, but I like the refractor. It's the one I seem to go to most at this point in time. Truth be known, it's my most recent acquisition, and it's also my most expensive acquisition. So that has a lot to do with it. The other thing that has kind of influenced my decision is I do like to do astrophotography. So I like to take pictures, and it just seems that although you can do that with other telescopes, um, this particular one... I bought it with the intent of doing that so it matches the camera that I've got, it matches the scope, that the uh, mount that I've got. Everything seems to work very nicely together. So that's a big reason for it. Now, it does take some time to set everything up. So if I'm going to do visual and I only have a few minutes, uh, I'm probably not going to go for it. I'll probably go for a, a Dobsonian that's fairly quick to set up. But if I do have some time, I'll, I'll set up the mount and do the calibration and use the refractor. So let's dig a little bit deeper into refractors. That way you'll kind of know when you decide to make your decision if a refractor is right for you. So if you came to this presentation and you didn't know anything about telescopes, and I asked you, close your eyes and describe a telescope to me. You'd probably be looking and thinking about the one in the picture here. And it's just ingrained to us uh, from early on that that's what a telescope looks like. Now, I do have a Dobsonian, and I take it out in the front yard, set it up near the sidewalk. Neighbors walk by, and they kind of glare at it like, hey, what's that thing? Uh, that's never happened with a refractor. seems like any time you describe a, ref a telescope or say something about a telescope, that's what people think about. Now, remember, that that's not a reason to make a decision, not at all. 
Uh, in fact, the, the biggest reason that you have for making the decision for which telescope to buy is, are you going to use it? Um, there was a group of astronomers, amateur astronomers, that were asked, you know, what's the most expensive telescope? And somebody came with kind of a smart answer and said, it's the one that sits in a box and you never use. Now, refractors come in all sizes with one basic shape. They've got the uh, long tubes and again, uh, you know, collects light on one end and you look through an eyepiece on the other side. Now, they're, they're not all the same size, obviously. Um, this is one that actually has a 40 inch diameter and it's at the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. And then they also have something like this uh, two and a half inch diameter that's made by William Optics. Uh, the one over to the left that you see is a Takahashi, which is a 100 millimeter, and it's got about a 3.9 inch diameter. By the way, interesting thing about the, the Yerkes one, it has a focal length of 63 and a half feet. So from the top of that thing all the way down to where um, the focal length is just in head of the eyepiece is 63 and a half feet. So that, that's just an amazing instrument. Okay, so how do these things work? Well, again, refractors, the long, skinny, hollow tube, it has an objective lens at one end, and all the way at the other end is got usually an, an eyepiece. The light rays come in to that objective lens into the telescope. They hit the lens, and they're bent, or they're refracted. Now, light rays are traveling from a distant object at 186,000 miles per second, and they slow down as they pass through the glass. Now, because it's a convex lens, it causes the light in the center to slow down a bit more than the ones on the edges. And that means that they will converge into the focal point. Um, now, the, think about it here. The larger diameter of that lens the longer the focal position is going to be. That's why you saw that that Yerkes uh, instrument with the 40 inch diameter had a focal length of about 63 and a half feet, whereas the smaller uh, refractor from William Optics, I think its focal position is maybe 14 inches. Now, just past that focal point over to the right, you're gonna see that the rays of light begin to stretch out again. And it's at that point in time where you put another convex lens to straighten those rays out. Uh, and that's the eyepiece. And so what that does is it, it you can look at this and see that you've got this big group of photons coming in. They converge down to a focal point. They begin to expand again, but then the eyepiece kind of straightens them out. So it just kind of takes everything and, and shrinks it down so that you can see it. Um, the eyepiece can be changed for different magnifications. So a little bit of history about the refractor. Some say the credit should go to Hans Lippershey. He was a German watchmaker and a master lens grinder. And the story is that he got the idea from watching his children play with some lenses that he had made. He submitted an application to the States General of the Netherlands, but uh, it seemed that there were a number of other individuals who had made similar designs and and also wanted to take credit all at the same time. So eh, the, the kid's story is a little questionable, but Nevertheless, it, it turns out to be a great thing for astronomy. They didn't actually give him a patent. They didn't give anybody a patent, but they did give him an acknowledgement and a pretty generous reward. Now, this was really good for astronomy again because the patent issue, uh, word spread very quickly. All throughout Europe, there were a number of other individuals who were picking up the, the design and beginning to make their own. And, one of those was a guy named Galileo Galilei. Now, he took Lippershey's design, or I'm not sure if he took his actual design or something like it, but 
he managed to uh, improve on it. So where Lipperschi's design had about a three-time magnification, Galileo managed to get 10 times magnification. And you can see his original telescope or a replica of it is that picture over on the left. I know that we, you know, we see the drawing that's pretty prominent everywhere on the right of Galileo looking through it. But, you know, his... Uh, his refractor didn't look anything like that. Um, since that time, there have been a, a number of major improvements, but for refractors, they, they still all seem to maintain that straight tube design. In only a few short years, uh, 1611, since the Lipperschi and later the Galileo design, Johannes Kepler improved on Galileo's design by leveraging a convex lens as an eyepiece instead of Galileo's concave one. The advantage to this was that the rays of light emerged from the eyepiece are converging and they allow for a wider field of view and greater eye relief. The image, however, is inverted and a lot of um, Telescopes today have the same issue. I mean, that's what it is. You just learn to deal with it. There, there are ways to get around it. We can talk about that later, but that's basically where it is. Um, it was over 100 years later that Chester Moore Hall in 1733 came up with something called the achromatic reflector, which introduced a lens with multiple elements that sell, helped solve some of the chromatic uh, aberrations w which were allowed for shorter wavelengths. Now, um, what that is, is sometimes when you look through a refractor, if it's just got the single lens, you might look to it, and if you position it on a star, it's almost like you'll see like a, a colored halo around a bright object. It really is. It's like the, the green and the red and the blue all around it. The reason for that is because the light waves, again, because they're being refracted and slowed down, they don't actually come to focus at exactly the same spot. Their focal points are a little bit off, and so that changes some of the ways they look. Now, his lens, the achromatic lens, really came into play to help focus the red and the blue. It was okay because the green, you know, some people say there's not a lot of green in space. So having the red and the blue kind of together really came out and helped quite a bit. Later on, there was something came in, which was a pretty big advancement, which was the aprochromatic refractor. Now, here is where they used three lenses. So instead of, again, that one or two in the front, they've actually got three lenses that come together. And what that does is it takes all three wavelengths, the red, the green, and the blue, and it makes them focus in the same plane. The result is that the color area is down to an order of magnitude less than the achromatic lens. And so let me show you what they look like just as a diagram. So this is just the standard lens. And, and you can see that the blue, the green, and the red really all have different uh, focal points. Now, the achromatic lens, again, two lenses, it brought it together and brought together the blue and the red lens, and then the, the green is kind of a little bit off. Again, because there's not a lot of green in space, and some people will even say there's no green in space. I, I'm not going to argue that, but, you know, it, it was okay. And then the last version that came out was the aprochromatic lens, and that's the one that actually takes three lenses and puts them together, and you can see that it makes the focal point of the red, the green, and the blue all come together in the same tight spot. You can imagine from cost, which one is more expensive. You probably start off with the single lens, the doublet, and then when you get into the triplet, that's where price seems to go up substantially. Let's get to that magnification thing. And I think this is a part where if you're looking for a telescope, you really need to pay attention here. There are times I've had my telescope out 
again, in the neighborhood, somebody comes by, they want to know what's going on. I show them certain things and you know, we talk about you know, what the telescope's doing, what we're looking at, where we're finding things, etc. There's invariably someone who will make a comment and say, yeah, my buddy has one of those telescopes and, and it gets a thousand percent magnification. What does this one do? How much is the magnification on this? That's about the time I'm just kind of rolling my eyes and biting my tongue and saying, okay, calm down. But I try to explain that magnification doesn't mean anything. It's don't don't get hung up on it. That's also why when I look at some of the big box stores that sell telescopes and they have an ad like you'll see here, 675 power magnification and and you know they have the picture of the telescope and then they have these beautiful deep sky images, and it just drives me up a wall. Let me explain to you why you don't want to fall for that. Here's the formula for magnification. It's the telescope's focal length divided by the eyepiece focal length. Here's my example. I've, again, got a telescope with a 700 millimeter focal length. If I put in a 10 millimeter eyepiece, and I can tell you right now, I rarely, if ever, have the seeing that I can do that. But if I do, okay, that gives me 700 divided by 10, which gives me a 70 magnification. Now, I can even go a little bit further, and there's something called the Barlow lens, which is another objective that you can put in between the telescope and the the eyepiece will give you, uh, in this particular case, three times magnification. So even if I did that with the Barlow lens, I'm only going to get to a magnification of 210. Now, the problem is, even with that, I'm probably not going to see something because it's going to be so dim and I would have to have just perfect conditions to be able to see anything. Uh, 675, yeah, not hardly. It's not going to work for me. I'm going to get about 210 maybe, and that's theoretical. The real thing that you might want to look at is useful magnification. So that is determined a little bit different. Uh, at least for a refractor, that's the diameter in millimeters times two. So let's see how that one works out. In my particular case, it's a 700 millimeter focal length, but it's got 102 diameter. So 102 millimeters times two gives me a 204 useful magnification. Uh, again, nothing like the 675. Again, the, you know, if you put the Barlow on, you get the 210. I, I'm going to tell you right now, it's really, again, it's really going to be good, good conditions for me to be able to get to that maximum. And it, it's nowhere near the 675 that they're advertising. Now, you know, there are other things, not just the mechanics of your telescope that you have to keep in mind, and that's the atmosphere. You're looking through dirty skies. It's dusty. There could be a lot of moisture. It's going to be different if you've got your telescope pointing straight up as opposed to pointing, you know, out west or out east towards the atmosphere, and there's always light pollution as well. The other thing to consider, too, is the mount that your telescope is on. If you're going to get to high magnifications, 210 plus, you, that mount better be solid as a rock because if it shakes a little bit, you're just not going to be able to see anything. I mean, breathing on that telescope is going to cause it to kind of shuffle around. So that's where I get into this thing is, you know, 675, really? I don't think so. The other thing that infuriates me is they... Advertisers do this all the time. You see those two pictures in there, the picture of the planets, crazy that they're all together like that because you're not going to see them that way. The other thing is that in the in the deep sky, that, that's the Trifid Nebula. I can guarantee you visually, you will not see that. There's no possible way. Number one, you're not going to see those colors. It's going to be a gray blob looking. And with that kind of telescope, that's not happening.
No, not at all. So I, I just think it's false advertisement that they put that in there and say, well, hey, this is what you're going to see. No, nah, not going to happen at all. Let me wrap up. Let me wrap this discussion of refractors up by giving you some of the pros and cons, or at least from my perspective, the pros and cons. The first thing is it's incredibly easy to set up and use. Take it out of the box, put it on a tripod, uh, take the dust cap off, lens in, and you're good to go. It, it, there's not really a lot you need to do. Generally, there's no additional alignment that's required. It's not like a Dobsonian where you have to align the mirrors together or anything like that. It has pretty low starting cost. You can get into something at about $200 plus a, a basic mount. Now, that's not I'm not saying that's a lot. Um, you're going to get the, the bare, bare minimum, but some of the big manufacturers do make something at that range. Uh, again, it's not going to be a fancy lens on it. It's just going to be a regular convex lens. It's not going to be a doublet or a triplet, anything like that. But if you're thinking about buying this as a present for, for a kid and you have no idea if um, two months from now they're going to want to look at the stars, it might be in the back of the closet or somebody took the lens off and they're trying to burn ants or, you know, light sticks on fire in the backyard. Yeah, 200 bucks, you, you didn't burn too much money. It's great for bright objects like the moon, the planets, some deep sky, and that's really going to be something that entertains kids, at least from the start. Deep sky objects, they might be a little hard to find, so it may be a little frustrating, but if you go after those bright things, you know, it's going to look pretty good. You probably... Just about any telescope that you get, you're going to see Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. So those are all pretty cool to look at. It can be used for terrestrial as well. So if you get bored with looking at stars, you could actually bring it out during the daytime. Don't point it at the sun, but bring it out to the day and, you know, look at birds or yeah, mountains, although we don't have any mountains in Memphis, but you could look at different things a long way away. Keep in mind that the it's probably, you know, flipped. You might have to get a diagonal that inverts everything back the other way, but you can deal with that pretty cheap. All right, some of the cons of this. It is limited to small diameter. And what I mean by small diameter is uh, five inch, maybe six inch diameter. You're not going to get much more than that because anything more than that is just going to be cost prohibitive. You, you won't get the bang for the buck. In fact, five is probably topping it out, and that's going to, those can be pretty expensive, too. Uh, not as great visually for deep sky objects. Again, the issue with deep sky objects, especially for beginners, they're going to be hard to find. So you might look at them and just see a little fuzzy thing. You really got to know what you're looking for, to be honest with you. So I wouldn't worry about that as much. The good ones are expensive. I'm not going to lie to you. Doublets and triplets, remember with the three glass, two and three glass, those are pricey. Uh, the one you see over on the side, that's a Skywatcher Esprit 100, and it is aprochromatic, so the three lenses. It's a four-inch diameter, and that one runs about 2500 bucks. Once you get up into that and you start paying for that really fancy glass, don't get me wrong, it's got a beautiful view, but it does get kind of expensive. And uh, that's pretty much it. So uh, if there are any questions, I'm sure Jeremy and Rick can answer them uh, at the end of the session. Thanks. All right, Rick, I think it's my turn. Did we lose Rick? It's knowing where he is. No, oh, he looks like he's in mute. Hey, Rick, I think we lost your audio just for a ah, second. There you go. How's that? Better. Okay. Sorry about that. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, ready for you to take it. Okay, excellent. So I basically had a lifelong passion for astronomy. I, I, got, I got started when I was about six years old, just really became fascinated with it. I got my first telescope when I was nine years old. My parents gave it to me for my birthday and it was a refractor. It was one of these cheapy department store, you know, 100 power, whatever that means, telescope. 
And it was just laughably crude by today's standards compared to what a lot of us have. But I will tell you that I loved that telescope. I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite activities, me and my buddy, he had the same telescope. We would set up the tent in the backyard. We would write love letters to our girlfriends and then we would go out and watch the stars. So that's kind of what I did growing up for a few years. And then of course, life takes over, adolescence, school, sports, the pressure of college career. So fast forward about 25 years later, and I got my second telescope. The reason I say that is because really this entire discussion is, it just depends on each individual, what your, what your passion is, what your needs are, what your focus is, what your desires are, and of course your budget and the trade-offs. So let me share your, my screen and I, I will show you what my second telescope looked like. And I need Rick to stop sharing his screen so I can share mine. There we are. Okay, so can everybody see this all right? We're doing this live here. Give me the thumbs up somebody. So this was my second telescope. Now this is a 20 inch Dobsonian was at a Memphis Astronomical Society board meeting. Rick gave, gave the announcement that a, a member wanted to sell this. Um, so I, I went ahead and went forward. Now, I thought about buying a telescope for several years before I got this one. And it was you know right after I started working. I was a full-time student until about the year 2000. Then I started working. A couple of years later, started researching telescopes and really didn't know which direction to go. Do I go reflector? Do I go refractor? Do I go big? Do I go small? Do I go, you know, the computer mounted ones? Just a lot of overthink. So I just kind of gave up. Um, but I knew I wanted a large telescope because I knew I wanted to do deep sky observing. And I knew that bigger was better. Now, this telescope, <laughs> there, there, there are some trade-offs to it. I, I've had a uh, had a lot of incredible experiences with this telescope. Wouldn't trade any of them for the world. What's interesting is, you know, you look down the barrel of it, you can see that it's a 20 inch diameter mirror. That's the size of the primary collecting area. And if you take this out to public observing sessions, people look at this and they're just like, this thing. I mean, is this a telescope? It doesn't look like a telescope. It looks like a Civil War cannon. Now, how does this thing work? And it's a telescope in that, you got to kind of change, change the way your brain thinks. The, the purpose of a telescope is not to magnify things. It's to gather light. The magnification is really a secondary function of a telescope. The reason why this telescope is so powerful is because it has a larger diameter collecting cell. So it can collect more light. And the analogy I like to use is imagine you're standing in an arid desert and it doesn't get much rain. And when it does, you want to try and collect as much water as you can. As you can. Well, you're not going to get very far by holding a teacup up. You'll get a lot more better, you'll get much better results if you spread out a large wide tarp like a tent, which will have a larger surface area for gathering water and then funneling it down. Same type of concept with a telescope like this. The purpose of it is to gather light. That's why Dobsonians are often called light buckets. Now the magnification comes with the eyepieces. It's how you contrive the optics at the eyepiece. That's where you get the magnification which is why pieces tend to be pretty costly. We'll talk more about that in a second. But this was my second telescope. I would never recommend, we would never recommend that you buy this type of telescope as your first telescope um, for a lot of reasons. Now, I decided to bite the bullet and pay the price because I knew that the payoff would be incredible. And I tell you, I've had a lot of experiences under dark skies, clear nights, and um, I wanted to go after deep sky objects, the star clusters, the nebulae, the galaxies, and I have a lot of experiences to share. I mean, one of my favorite, of course, is being at the Okie Tech Star Party a year ago and having this under truly Bortle 1 slash 2 skies where it was really dark. And I just, the, the view, M27, the, the, the Dumbbell Nebula was just spectacular in this telescope. The downside is it's three o'clock in the morning. I've been out observing for eight hours, dead tired, and I go to bed. And in my mind, there's a series of all these steps that I have to go through to break this telescope down, pack it up, it takes two people to take it down. So I can't do this alone. 
It's either me and Brian, me and Keith, or me and Rick that typically are doing that. Then I got to drive 45 minutes from Burton Sugar Farm back home. When I get home, it's either covered in dew or frost. I got to start unpacking some of the stuff, get it laid out so it can dry out. Then I got to take a shower. Then I got to go to bed. So there is, there is suffering involved in observational astronomy as you scale up in size. Bigger is better in terms of experience, but not necessarily in terms of the pain that you have to endure to, to see those spectacular views. Now, this is a telescope I would recommend. I also own this one. It's a 10 inch Dobsonian, half the size of the one I just showed you. And I've gotten a lot of good, great use out of this telescope, especially this year with the pandemic where we're shut down and social distancing. Very easy to use this telescope. Um, I bought this one used for 350 bucks. It's a situation where a lady bought bought it, used it maybe once or twice, and then it sat in her bedroom for 10 years collecting dust. Picked it up at a discount, and this is a great beginner scope. Again, a Dobsonian, the kind that Rick was talking about. And um, the thing I also like about this telescope is it's very portable. I can easily fit it in the back of my small SUV. I drive a RAV4, transport it to a dark sky site, uh, set it up, take it down in only a couple of minutes. This is what I like to call my quick and dirty scope, which, you know, if if conditions are favorable and I just want to look at something a minute, I'll go to this scope, my 10 inch Dobsonian. So again, I'll, if you can get a used Dobsonian, either eight inch, six inch, or I like the 10 inch, um, that is a great choice for a starter scope. And I'll show you this also, Rick will talk about more of this in a second, but the key to getting good use out of a telescope like this is you've got to have a tell rad. Now I'm showing you a viewfinder here. I use both. I won't get into my methodology, but a Telrad is, in my opinion, critical. It's a critical and absolutely essential accessory for finding things uh, by hand. And what it does is you turn it on, it gives you a little three ring target. You just look right through the, the glass plate or the plastic plate. And all you gotta do is just point it at the object you're trying to look at. And if it's visible naked eye, you can literally find it in your telescope is collimated right in a matter of seconds. So the Telrad is the key. Now, the downside to Dobsonians, other than collimation, which Rick mentioned, is they typically don't track. Um, if you have just a simple alt as mount, you're doing everything you can. And uh, you have to keep moving the telescope to keep up with the object as it moves through the sky. And it's okay for a while, but after a while, it gets kind of old. So what I've done recently is I've picked up a couple of what are called Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. They're used. And again, all my telescopes are used. I, I, I picked these up. This is a great way to find a telescope, either get involved in your local astronomical society or get on a site like Astromart and people are selling used equipment. A lot of people buy a telescope, use it a couple of times, and then they become don't wanters quickly and they end up in the attic taking up space, don't want it anymore, willing to just get rid of it at a discount. That's how I bought my telescopes. That's a great option for you for buying your first telescope. And again, a schmidt cassegrain design is kind of a hybrid between which uses lenses and a reflector which uses mirrors. And it basically uses a combination of both in a catadioptric system. And it's kind of a folded um, design, mirror design. And the, the advantage of that is it's, fairly compact and has a longer focal length. So it's pretty powerful. The downside is it can be pretty expensive. Um, now that, that's again where buying them used can be, be to your advantage. So one telescope I bought was a three and a half inch ETX Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Now this is a smaller scope, you know, my larger dob is 20 inches. This one's only three and a half inches. However, I bought this telescope pretty much exclusively for the solar eclipse that we had back in 2017. And again, we've got another one coming up in, in a little less than four years. But this is a great telescope for looking at the moon and the sun and some of the brighter planets. And um, it has a go-to controller, which I won't get into the details of how, it's, uh, how to set this up. I've got a train coming here in just a second because I'm in Collierville, so bear with me. I'm gonna have to mute myself. This is the disadvantage of doing things live until this train passes. One second.
Okay. So this is kind of my quick and dirty scope. Here comes the train. Bear with me, guys. Sorry for the sound. So we're, we're kind of all staying home now. Uh, on clear nights, like tonight and like tomorrow night, if the brighter objects are out, whether it's a crescent moon, which I love looking at through a telescope, or some of the brighter planets, I'll typically set this telescope up in my backyard, my back patio, and then just get it you know, lined up and put it on the moon and just let it sit there. And it's a great telescope for doting on a brighter object like the moon. Um, just had some spectacular views of the brighter objects. This is not necessarily a good choice for deep sky stuff because it's smaller, it doesn't gather as much light, but it's a good quick and dirty beginner scope. Um, if you wanna look at brighter things like the moon, the planets, get a filter, you can look at the sun and it's, it's got a lot of a wow factor too. I mean, showing somebody who's never looked through a telescope before craters on the moon or the rings of Saturn through a telescope like this, it can be a, a really awe-inspiring experience. Here's the eyepiece I use. This is a 31 millimeter Antores W70 eyepiece. It's a wider, you know, it's a, a lower power eyepiece, which means that a wider field of view. I can fit the moon in or the sun in this eyepiece, costs about hundred bucks. So that's a good quick and dirty telescope. And again, I bought this one used, I think for 350 bucks. So the eyepiece is another hundred, so that's 450 bucks. So that's a nice, smaller Schmidt Cassegrain, portable, easy to set up, fairly easy, and uh, great for brighter stuff. Now, I recently picked these two up. Um, one of them is an 8-inch. The other one's a 10-inch. And these are, again, Schmidt Cassegrains on an equatorial mount. So it has an equatorial fork wedge, uh, wedge on a fork mount. And again, you're just pointing it at the North Star. And from my driveway, I've got the North Star just clears my roof. So what I can do with this telescope is line it up to the North Star and it will track. And if you've owned a Dobsonian for a while and you where you have to move it by hand if it's not on a tracking mount, having a telescope that tracks is really nice. So that's one of the reasons why I went with this telescope. The eight inch is fairly portable, fairly easy to set up. Again, I've gotten some help on this one. The previous owner owned it for like 30 years, didn't want it anymore. Again, situation where it's just kind of sitting in the attic, uh, bought it at a discount. Rick worked on it for me and, and really helped me get it going. And the beauty is this thing, once I've got it lined up with the North Star, it will just track. So here I've got it pointed at Mars. Uh, Mars reached opposition a couple of months ago. And so I'll just set up in the driveway. And here you can see Mars rising shortly after dusk. And I'll just sit down, get comfortable, and literally just dote on Mars for several minutes. And the nice thing is, once I got it plugged into my battery, it'll just track. So I can go inside, I can eat dinner, I can fold laundry, do my honeydew chores, uh, take a shower, take a leak, whatever, come out several minutes later, and it's still tracking on Mars. You can see I use the Telrad to find it. I find the objects by hand with this telescope. It doesn't have a, a go-to feature. But if you come out several minutes or even hours later, it'll still be tracking on whatever object you've put it on if you've got it lined up properly um, because it's on an equatorial uh, wedge. So I've kind of gotten used to the, the tracking feature of a telescope like this. It's another option to consider. If you can get something in the eight, you know, six to eight inch range, Schmidt Cassegrain, um, not necessarily a go-to because those can be expensive, but just on a simple um, fork wedge that has a clock drive that tracks, that can be a good option to consider also for a beginner telescope. So kind of summing things up here, the three telescopes that we presented, again, refracting telescopes, they, 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 can, be, they can be beautiful, but they're limited to smaller diameter because they're made of glass and glass gets expensive real quick. The four inch that Keith showed you in his previous video can call, brand new can cost up to 2,500 bucks. So it can get costly real quick. Best for brighter objects like the moon and planets. The Newtonian reflector, which Rick talked about and I mentioned briefly here, that's the best bang for your buck in terms of aperture size and cost. Again, the, the same cost for uh, my used 20 inch 
uh, Dobsonian is about the say, same as a brand new four to eight inch refracting telescope, just to kind of give you an idea. Now the challenges, of course, I mentioned them, portability. There's a lot of suffering when you get 16, 18, 20 inches if your goal is to get to a dark sky location. Um, and then of course, collimation. Quick story, Okie Tech Star Party, had my 20 inch Dobsonian out there a year ago, got it all set up, drove two days to get out there, really excited to be under dark skies for the first time. And I was struggling with collimation on my 20 inch um, Dobsonian telescope. Fortunately, there was a guy named Bob right across the way who was right there. He was able to help me get it collimated, but I'm not an expert on collimation right now. I still need help with that telescope. So that is the downside to a new Newtonian reflector. Now the schmidt cassegrain again, it's, um, it's good for all types of observing, whether it's deep sky or, or the brighter stuff, depending on the size of the scope. I own a three and a half inch, I own an eight inch and a 10 inch, great telescopes. They can be expensive though, if you're buying them brand new. All the telescopes I bought are used, and I know all the telescopes that uh, Rick has bought has also been used. So with that, I'm actually gonna open it up now for um, any other questions or comments and then turn it back over to Rick. Oh, okay, so I got a question here. Don't be shy. How heavy is a big telescope? Too, by the way, so. Yeah. So I got a question here on how heavy is my, my big telescope. So <laughs> um, this is one of the reasons why back in, back about 18 years ago, I kind of shied away from buying a telescope because I wanted at least 16 inches for my reflector. And I thought a 16 inch tube, where am I going to store that? And how am I going to transport it? So I didn't really know how to do that. So I kind of gave up. My 20 inch comes in pieces. So I've got the mirror box, which is where the primary mirror is the 20 inch. I've got eight aluminum poles. So it's on a kind of a truss mount. And then I've got the secondary cage, which is where my secondary mirror is. So I literally have to assemble it and disassemble it every time I go out to a dark sky site. Now the primary mirror box, I think is 60 pounds. I haven't you know, exactly weighed it. I could pick it up myself and put it on the back of my pickup truck if I wanted to, but I'm getting a little older. And one of these days I'm gonna snap a disc in my back. So I always get help with that. You know, I, I usually, when I load that into the back of my truck, um, I get either Rick or Brian or Freddie or some unlucky soul to help me, whoever just happens to be around there. And then I also need help building it. So it's a two person project, but it comes in several pieces. So. Another thing you don't want to do is drop that two inch thick, $4,000, 20 inch mirror, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. So there definitely is some maintenance involved. All right, a good starter scope for astrophotography. This is really more of a Keith question. Um, his William Optics scope would be an excellent um, choice for astrophotography. I think it's a four inch, isn't it? Isn't it? Rick, he's got a William Optics on a My Team mount. That's his. Right. That's his setup. The 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 key features for astrophotography are going to be a sturdy mount. That's that's probably bigger than anything. A sturdy mount. You can use a Newtonian. You can use a refractor. You can use a dob. You can use a catadoptic. You can you can use that eight inch uh, Schmidt that you've got. Yep. Uh, for astrophotography very easily but the key the first key feature is a good sturdy mount it can't be shaking while you're taking long exposures the wind blows it needs to stay still um also I will tell you mechanical quality if you have a mount that have substandard uh, gears you will never get a good photography right Yep. And my mount does shake. I will tell you, I showed you the uh, the eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain. I'm looking at Mars. If I'm out there and there's a trial, like what you just heard a few minutes ago, that scope will shake and Mars will shake in my eyepiece. 
So it's a little frustrating. Whenever I have a tram, my house is very close to the train tracks in Collierville. On any of my SCTs, I, I have to take a break in order train passes. So it would not be a good setup for astrophotography. I, uh, I started with, well, I started with astrophotography with film cameras, but then I quickly migrated to video, uh, astro video. Um, and I've got video of Saturn and Jupiter uh, from my driveway in town with that Parks telescope I had. And I was using eyepiece projection, so it was very highly magnified. And uh, I turned on the video recorder and whatever. I walked into the house and came back. But later when I was looking at the video, there was this there was this jiggle in the in the image and I figured out later it was when I was walking across the driveway uh, so it doesn't take a lot yeah and I'll tell you with Keith he, he, he spends at least an hour getting set up whenever he goes to well either in his backyard or to a dark sky site for astrophotography so there's a lot that's involved not only in getting your rig set up and all the camera equipment um, plugged in, but also getting the uh, the mount um, exactly aligned with um, with the North Star, polar aligned. I guess it's polar alignment. So you have got to be very precise because whatever object you're taking subs on, it has got to track exactly very precisely, or you're going to get star trails whenever you're taking an image. So it's not only the equipment, but it's also the, the process, the procedure, which is why I haven't gotten into astrophotography yet. It's just, it's not for me right now. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and share a couple of things real quick. Um, first off, I wanna show a couple of uh, websites. So our, yeah, you're seeing the Memphis Astronomical Society website. So I thought I'd pull up some, uh, department store, telescopes. Um, of course, this is what you get at Target. <laughs> it's not what I was looking for. Uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, they're, they're, I, I honestly wouldn't waste money on them for kids. Uh, they're too shaky. They're too hard to use. I cannot tell you the number of times parents have brought their children and one of these telescopes to the Memphis Astronomical Society meeting and go, you know, and, and so why can't we see Saturn in this? Why can't we see the moon and stuff? And they're, they're hard to use because they're so poorly made. Um, again, it's just much easier to take a, a, a four and a half, six inch daub, even a tabletop model and, and pointed at the moon, pointed at the planets. Uh, here's what first comes up on Amazon. Now, Amazon's got some nice stuff too, so don't get me wrong. But I wanted to spotlight these two websites. So there's one called Cloudy Nights, a great source for you for classified ads for astronomical equipment. These are typically astronomy hobbyists, not just somebody that stumbled across a telescope and wants to sell it. Um, not, uh, eBay is not bad either, at least for astronomy equipment. Most of the time it's, uh, uh, they're pretty good about being honest about what they're advertising or what they're trying to sell. Uh, same with Astromart. Again, this is a astronomy related website. Uh, they have a lot of stuff here. Classified ads is just one of them. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we have our Facebook page where some people do toss up uh, telescopes for sale every now and then, or like Don. Uh, Don here is making one, so not for sale yet, but we'll see. I'm just teasing. Um, let me now sh finish sharing my other part. Okay. So, um, 
to continue on with astronomy related stuff, maybe not just telescopes, but uh, uh, one of the first accessories I think anybody ought to have is a, is a good pair of astronomy binoculars. Not every pair of binoculars that you buy are going to be good for astronomy use. Um, a 50 millimeter objective, that's this first lens here, is the least size I would use for astronomy. Uh, 7 to 10 power is about as much as you can handhold steady. So, you know, uh, something uh, seven by fifties are are excellent for this sort of thing. I I say stay away from zoom optics. So in both spotting scopes and binoculars, you can get zoom optics. You know they'll they'll zoom from seven power to twenty five power. That's fine when there's plenty of light, but to do that zoom function takes a lot of lot more glass elements and you lose a little bit of light every time you hit a sur reflect off a surface or go through a surface of glass so the more optical elements there are in here the more light you're going to lose another thing to consider for binoculars and is the use of BAK4 glass that's a type of glass and it's hard to find that spec when you're looking at binoculars. You have to look hard at the binocular specs to determine whether it's plain BK7 glass or the more transmissive BAK4 glass. Seven by 50s already said that. Eyepieces, uh, what I just said about uh, number of elements applies here as well. There are compromises and trade-offs. Uh, you know, some of my best, most expensive eyepieces have got quite a few elements in them, but they make up for it by providing a much wider field of view. But the, uh, and the simplest ones, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got a, Jeremy was, well, let's talk about finders. We were talking about finders. Jeremy's talking about a little finder scope and a tail rad on his dive. I don't do that. I have a tail rad and then I've got a 32 millimeter, two inch Urful eyepiece. And it is horrible. It's got astigmatism, but the, but the, uh, uh, the lens is, is almost an inch, an inch and a quarter in diameter. Just the, just the piece of glass itself. It's almost look, looking at a small picture screen, uh, TV screen. You know, and, and the uh, spherical aberration is horrible. As you move it across the sky, everything moves in, in curves. But it's it's a wonderful finder. It creates a, it turns my whole 13-inch telescope into a wide field of view finder. So I use that, and then I'll put in a high magnification eyepiece to look at what I'm looking at. Uh, there's a whole course we could do on eyepieces and eyepiece designs. Uh, inch and a quarter is the most standard diameter for barrels. Um, the bigger and more expensive telescopes will start getting into two inch uh, focusers. And um, I actually, I don't, most of my stuff's in the two inch range anymore. But uh, there's a lot of good brands out there. And uh, Plossils, if you don't, if, so that's a good place to start. If you're into this, they, in fact, made all of them sell small kits of inch and a quarter diameter plossal eyepieces from like 25 down to 10 millimeter. And eyepieces, the bigger the number, the lower the magnification and the wider the field of view. A small number is going to be higher magnification and narrow field of view and less light. But a, a, a four millimeter eyepiece, you know, I promise you that's got to be a really expensive eyepiece to be any good. Uh, typically, in the plossal designs, you start to around the 10 millimeters, about as high magnification or as small a number as you really want to mess with. 
talk about finders for a minute. I am a big fan of the Telrad. Uh, these have been around for a long time. It's like the uh, heads up display in a fighter jet. It basically superimposes a, a set of rings on the background sky. There's no magnification. You look at it through the back end at 45 degrees to this piece of uh, plastic and then uh, straight on to the sky. Uh, great. It works with you with your charts or anything you see the constellation you're trying to look at you can line up this circle uh, where uh, on those stars in that constellation where the thing is you're trying to look for and uh, it'll be in the eyepiece when you go look rigel systems makes something very similar but the form factor is different here you can see the again that uh, diagonal piece of plastic in there that, that they project the um, image on and then there are what are uh, were started out as gun sights. These are uh, what's called a red dot finder. And you've got a little laser down in here projecting a little red dot up here on this piece of plastic. And you look straight through it and see where that red dot is imposed on the background sky. Uh, flashlights, LED, red, flat, red LED flashlights. Uh, you start doing observing, you're going to want these. I have a bunch of these. I love these. These are a uh, flip of a switch. They either go white LEDs or red LEDs. You got a thumb uh, uh, knob there to adjust the brightness and uh, very, very handy. And a neck strap so you don't lay it down and walk off and leave it. Uh, and, and you always want two, right? because you need one to go find this one once you've laid it down someplace and forgot where it was at. Uh, here's another variation on the same theme. I've never used one of these, but I like the way it's built. I like the form factor there. I may have to get one someday. And another one. Sky charts, uh, you know, if you've got a, somebody you're working with for young person or something, you're just looking for another uh, Christmas present. There are some uh, good um, star charts out there. Of course, you know, the, uh, the Memphis Astronomical Society's very own Bill Bustler, William Bustler created the Amateur Guide to the Messier Objects versions one and two. Um, both uh, volumes will get you all 110 Messier objects with star hopping instructions, basically how to uh, guide your telescope from one star to the next to find that very dim faint object that you're trying to look for. Makes a great pr Christmas present. They're available from the Memphis Astronomical Society. Contact me for details. <laughs> uh, sky maps, uh, skymaps.com is free uh, website. You can go online, print these out. It, Front and back of the of the thing will have what's up to look at this month. There's a new chart for every month. Uh, really nice sky charts. We have nice hand drawn sky charts in these. These are fancier. This is my favorite, and I keep this with me all the time. So I'm big into electronics. I have. Uh, computers or iPads or phones, whatever I've got that's got all my sky charts in it until it gets really, really, really cold and the battery lasted about 10 minutes and now everything's not working and I drag out the paper charts to go find what it was I wanted to look at. Uh, I love my Wiltarian uh, Star Atlas, great charts. Uh, this is supposedly a really nice set of, of charts. Jeremy, I think, has these. I think it's a little bit of an oxymoron. The Pocket Sky Atlas Jumbo Edition. That makes sense, right? Kind of like uh, military intelligence or something. Anyway, um, so uh, nice set of sky charts for those. I, I swear I'm gonna buy a copy of this, the Astrophotography Sky Atlas. So this should have uh, tips and information you need for uh, considering taking pictures of things, the bright overall surface brightness of 
deep sky objects, what have you, to give you uh, maybe some starting points on um, what to consider when you want to take pictures of these things. And then I think this would just be a great uh, one to look at. Apparently, it's got a lot of nice uh, stories about the myth and mythologies around the objects in the sky, the constellations, what have you. Electronic sky charts, you know, if, once you get into this, you'll, uh, you'll want to have something with you. When somebody asks you, you know, what was that bright thing in the uh, uh, eastern sky this morning at four o'clock, it's not always Venus. <laughs> A lot of times it is, but not always. So, um, having uh, a handy sky program on your phone, on your iPad, your laptop, whatever to refer to uh, is always helpful. Starry Night is my favorite for iPads and iPhones. That is called Sky Safari for the iPhones. Uh, Starry Night for the computers. Uh, sky X is uh, Windows base. I think they do have a, a Mac version now, and I know they have a uh, iPad version. This is a little more professional leaning uh, system here. They uh, SkyX has got all kinds of software to control your cameras, your mounts, your observatory dome, and everything else. Stellarium has is a great program, very capable. And one of the key features of it is it's absolutely free. So if you're looking for free and a great place to start is Stellarium. Laser pointers, green is what you wanna use. The reason for that is the human eye is most sensitive to green light. Therefore, when you take a little low powered green laser pointer and point it in the sky, where it's really dark, you can see the beam as it reflects off particles of dust and water droplets in the air um, better than you can a red laser of the same power. Uh, be careful with them. Uh, don't point them in people's faces. You get something bigger than, than five milliwatt, be careful about pointing it at airplanes. The end. Uh, so that's all I've got. Uh, if anyone has any questions, comments, uh, you want to talk about this, if you're uh, shy and don't want to discuss it here, feel free to reach out to me or Jeremy or any of us that, uh, uh, let me show you where our contact information is. Stop sharing the screen. Try to get that. And then share a different screen. Okay. So if you go to the Memphis Astronomical Society website page, you will see. Uh, several of us have our phone numbers and email addresses listed directly. Uh, I'm here, Rick at MemphisAstro.org. That's my cell phone. Feel free to call me anytime. Uh, Bill Bustler, I don't think is on here, but he's a very long standing member of the MAS and very knowledgeable. I'm sure he'll be glad to talk to you about it. Jeremy's numbers are here. Keith's numbers are here. Uh, Mark Matthews is our VP of observing. His information's here. If you get in touch with one, <clears throat> also just if you send an email to info at memphisastro.org, that goes to several of us. We'll be glad to get answers. If we don't know the answer, we'll get you to somebody that does. Um, Glad to help out in any way we can. After many years of this, the most fun I have in astronomy now is helping other people to enjoy the hobby. Do you have any other comments or questions? 
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here for a minute. Um, hang on one sec. Okay, so just kind of wrapping up here. Oop. Go back here, bear. Sorry about this. So just kind of wrapping up here. Um, our YouTube channel has also a lot of great videos and uh, hopefully resources to help you guys. The world of eyepieces is a whole nother discussion that we don't have time to get into tonight can be very costly. However, there are some cost-effective options to consider quality eyepieces for, um, for any type of uh, telescope, including beginner telescopes like the ones we discussed tonight. So I encourage you to check that out if you want some more insight into eyepieces. Also on our website, there's two links in the upper left on how to buy a new telescope. And then also if you need help with uh, setting up your new telescope, excellent write-ups. And I uh, would encourage you to check that out as well. So, yeah. And then, of course, Rick touched on that. If you have any other comments or questions, feel free to leave them e either in the bottom of this uh, video or just send us an email, info at memphisastro.org or memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com. And, again, I'll have links to these two documents in the description of this video below available for anyone who's watching this either live tonight or on our YouTube channel later. And of course, that's the December sky map and then also our membership application. And you can send us an email at memphisastronomicalsociety at gmail.com. If, you, uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, just fill that out and send that over. And of course, our details, we have a Facebook group where there's a lot of correspondence, including information on used telescopes and used eyepieces for sale. I picked up a set of used eyepieces off of our Facebook group a few months ago, a set of Explore Scientific, low power, medium power, and high power. So I'm actually somebody who's, who's purchased astro equipment off of our Facebook group. And then of course, take a minute to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already. And if you wanna be on list, go to the website joinmas.com and enter your name and email address. So that pretty much wraps things up, guys. Again, we just wanted to make this um, both a formal presentation and interactive as much as possible. Does anybody have any other comments or questions as we're wrapping up here tonight? Swiss shirts are going fast. Two have already been spoken for, so. Oh, great. <laughs> what, four to go? Four to go. Two more. So reaching out to Rick if you... Uh, if you want to get your Memphis Astronomical Society sweatshirts, oh yeah, we got to start selling slippers because my feet are absolutely freezing right now. <laughs> I need to wrap this thing up. I'm, I'm toasty warm with the sweatshirt, but uh, I got to get thicker socks in the, in the winter in the winter months. So, and and if you're a member or even if you're not a member and want the Memphis Astronomical Society branded stuff, we have a source. Uh, we have shirts. We have. Uh, things that, that can be ordered one at a time. Uh, these shirts are left over from when we were buying them in bulk and screen printing them. Uh, but uh, uh, we now have a place that will embroider stuff for us on a as, uh, as ordered basis and what have you. So these really are leftovers from that and they're new old stock uh, and just need to get rid of them, so I quit carrying them around. Um, so, extra large, black, I mean, dark blue or white. Excellent. Okay, well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap the meeting up, unless anybody has anything else they want to, any other comments, questions, or anything else they want to add. Um, it's December 4th today. Of course, we're going to Get into the holiday season. Hope everybody has a safe, happy, and uh, prosperous holiday season. 
Our next meeting will actually be, somebody correct me if I'm wrong here, it'll be the second Friday in December or in January. So New Year's Day is actually on a Friday this year. So is our next meeting the following week or is it two yeah, weeks? It's, uh, it's going to be uh, January the 8th. January the 8th. Okay. And we're going to do another discussion on telescopes. So kind of this, this one is like, if you telescope for Christmas, the one in January is, okay, you've got your telescope. How Let's, do you use it? Yeah. How do you get it set up and how do you use it? So there's kind of, it's kind of a two part series and we'll get into some more, some more of the theory and some more of the science behind it as well. So that will be January the 8th, 2021. Board so, meeting is next Friday night. Uh, next Friday night. So that'll be the 11th of December, right? So the year is winding down pretty quickly here. So we'll send a notice out soon. And we'll also send notices out regarding next week's virtual star party. And then also um, any upcoming observing uh, sessions and kind of doing everything impromptu now. But with that, I just want to say thanks again. I know it's been 2020 has been kind of an unusual year. Thank you to everybody who's contributed and supported us through uh, making this adjustment. I uh, can't say enough about everybody's efforts. This is a volunteer army. We're all busy. And any, any contributions to our society have been, been greatly appreciated uh, by myself as well as other members of the board. So everybody just stay safe. Enjoy your holiday season. And uh, we will see you guys. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. Happy holiday to all and Merry Christmas too. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. <laughs>